Welcome for the finale of Drum Solo Week, Neil Peart. for a long time, years, that this wasn't a big deal. Turns out, it kind of is. This time I wanted to focus on specifically Neil Peart's creativity and the fact that a lot of times when drummers are covering these songs, they're like, uh oh, that part is coming. I hope I get it right. I'm just picking 10 instances. Of course, you know, we got over 170 songs or something like that. There's a bunch of examples of Neil Peart's creativity. I wanted to give 10 examples of why. Neil Peart is my favorite drummer of all time. Why I hold him as one of the best drummers of all time. I want to make a clarification about something. And this battle goes on for like, it's been going on forever and ever. People saying that this drummer or that drummer is the best drummer. There's no such thing as the best drummer. There's no such thing as the best guitarist. There's no such thing as the best bass player. There's no such thing as the best keyboard player. There's no such thing as the best dad. Well, wait a minute. My kids say I'm the best dad, so maybe there is that. But although there isn't the best of the best, there is a level of greatness that we could call legendary that, you know, some drummers occupy. I would put Neil Peart in that echelon of drummers. I would put, for example, Buddy Rich as another example of drummers in that echelon. As far as popularity goes, I get a lot of slack for saying that Neil Peart is a better drummer than John Bonham. That's my opinion, but we could say, as far as rock goes, at least, John Bonham is way up there, legendary status drummer. So there are some of these drummers, and there are others. I'm not going to go, you know, go on, on a whole spiel of the list of drummers that are legendary drummers. There, There's quite a few of them that are very unique, and they have their own style. And they have their own reasons for being as great as they were or as great as they are if they're still alive. And in Neil Peart's case, I've always contended that the reason why he's one of the best drummers of all time, one of the greatest, a legend, epic, is that he's, he was so creative. He didn't require lots of technicality to come up with drum parts that leave the listener or the viewer mesmerized. And you watch a lot of drummers, excellent drummers. Really technical drummers, flashy, fast, dizzying, technical, all this stuff. But if you see, if you 
got the privilege of seeing Neo play live in person and you're watching him play, you just awestruck. And you can't always pinpoint why that is. He just had the it factor. He had it. Whatever it is, he had it. And how he was so specific in how he chose to play the drum parts and how he chose to tune his drums and how he chose to compose his drum parts in a creative way that was so that they became so unique to him. You hear those parts and you know that's Neil Peart. And not every drummer, not every great drummer is like that for whatever reason. Again, I'm not saying Neil Peart is the best drummer of all time. I would never contend that because that's impossible to quantify. Because in that top section of drummers, greatest of all time, they all can do something that the other drummers can't do. And in Neil's case, I think those drummers are not as creative as him. Neil was not a session drummer. He was Rush's drummer. So everything he, he did was related to the songs that the three of them, you know, Giddy and Alex writing the music. He didn't even write the music. He just added his drums later. He adapted what he, you know, his profession to that situation. Whereas if he was a session drummer, maybe like Steve Gadd, as an example, Steve Gadd might sound different in different situations because of what the band or the artist required of him. And he may sound different. Steve Smith. There's another example. He was he's in various bands, known for being in Journey, Vital Information, and other things. So he sounds different. You know, he's done a lot of clinics. He's done a lot of videos. Um, he's a very creative drummer as well, but in a different way. So let's put us put aside the Neil Peart is the greatest drummer of all time. You say he's one of the best drummers of all time. You'd say he's legendary status drummer. If you want to argue that he's the best drummer of all time, you can do it. I'm not going to stop you, but I'll leave that to other people to do. But in any case, what we're here to do today, I'm picking 10 of Neil's most creative parts to me. When I looked through the catalog, I just picked what struck out at me, like what was obvious to me. That's what I'm going to pick today. So here we go, finally. And these are in chronological order from oldest to newest. The first creative drum part I'm going to pick, one of his greatest, and I feature this in other videos, is his first drum solo in Vitor and the Snow Dog off of Fly By Night. What an incredible little drum solo that is. I've seen a lot of drummers try to imitate that little solo. I think I may have seen literally one, maybe two drummers play it exactly like Neil played it. It is, for some reason, and it's single stroke rolls. I find very few drummers know how to play that. Uh, I, to this day, I have a difficult time figuring out what he's, what he's doing. I still someday I think I'm going to try it, <laughs> but it's really hard. So Biter on the Snow Dog is my first example of one of Neil Peart's most creative drum parts. The second example I'm going to pick is from Natural Science off of Permanent Waves. I don't spend too much time on this. I mean, the drumming on that song, Natural Science, is incredible. This is one little snippet, and I'm going to play it right now. That really, uh, like, staccato, staggering, um, hit you in the face start stop start stop type of drumming that just that little segment really difficult to imitate um really difficult to um you know to put the timing on what you know what's the time signature for that actually that's not even that important but the fact that it's so creative and that little time slot and you know the rest of the song continues and i've compared that to some of the little drum parts that come up in yyz the next record and i think actually this one is more complicated than any of the drum parts in yyz it's um really creative like it's almost like he did it on the fly on the fly and it just came out right but that little drum part on natural science incredibly creative on his part the next drum part one of my favorite creatives of neil on the drums is countdown on the signals album i think this is woefully underrated as one of neil peart's greatest drumming performances nobody talks about it but i'm going to talk about it here the song is a gymnastics exercise in drumming he's all over the kit on this song it's really important to hear this song with headphones or good speakers and loud <laughs> because there's certain when he when getty lee towards the end of the song is singing the chorus for kind of the last time neil is actually going down the kit hitting the lower toms and then at the at the end of that chorus he's hitting that gong bass drum and if you have good headphones or you have good speakers with some good bass, you're going to feel that gut punch of those gong bass drums at the end. 
he really uses the entire kit seamlessly on this song. And there's some like marching drum so- uh, sound at the beginning. And it's just, you know, we know the building and the anticipation of what this song is. I think from a drummer's perspective, he does that as well throughout the whole song and really is going up and down the kit. It's rare that you hear the gong bass drum in Rush's songs. I think he uses it more live, but in this particular song, that, that gong bass drum is the highlight for me. The way that Neil, even in the fade out, he's playing different parts. I would suggest taking another listen to Countdown off of Signals. The fourth song I'm going to pick that is an incredible example of, me, of Neil's creativity is Territories off of Power Windows. When I heard this song for the first time, I thought it was pretty good when I was hearing it at first. And then the chorus comes along, and that is so creative on his part. He's playing the, the floor toms and going up on the high toms, and then going to the floor toms, and then going to the high toms. It just doesn't skip a beat. And it goes really nicely with how Getty is singing. So that little part, the whole song, drumming-wise, is really creative. But the drumming during the chorus of Territories is very unique. And you'll note that a lot of these drum parts that we talk about throughout this list, they're unique. They only happen that time. And you won't hear them in in any other place in Russia's discography. But that just shows the incredible creativity and depth of knowledge that Neil had on the drums from a creative and compositional perspective that I think surpasses almost every drummer. And like I mentioned before, other drummers are better at doing certain things than Neil was. But as far as creativity, he nails it yet again during this song, Territories, especially during the chorus. Next song I want to talk about that exemplifies Neil's creativity is the song Mission on the next record, Hold Your Fire. Mission is a fan favorite because of the emotional aspect. But during the instrumental part of the song, Actually, all three of them are jamming pretty well. But the part where Neil incorporates the xylophone sound during that instrumental breakdown, when you're hearing him using the xylophone and snare drum when they're when he's playing that kind of little solo part, and Alex is doing that kind of a patio type guitar, and then all three of them jam, jam out, and then, you know, they're silence, basically. And you just hear the keyboards. But that instrumental breakdown where Neil is using both the snare and the xylophone at the same time. And of course, you can't do that really unless you program it. And in live versions of Mission, he's just playing on the xylophone or the uh, mini marimba, whatever he called it. But again, very creative. When I heard that for the first time, I go, oh, wow, that's, that's really cool. Never heard him do something like that, where he's incorporating both the snare sound and the xylophone sound at the same time. And even though he didn't do it live again, you know, it's easy to do the, that kind of stuff in the studio. But again, another creative thing from him that he really didn't do any other time. Next drum creative drum part that I want to talk about from Neil is off of yet the next record, which is uh, Presto. And the song is Scars. This is very interesting because the drumming in Scars, Neil incorporated in his drum solos um, pretty much during every tour. I don't know if he did it during the Vapor Trails tour, and I don't, he didn't do it in the R40 tour. Pretty much every tour, he incorporated the drumming in Scars in his drum solos. So in R30, for example, that tour where a song was played from every record except Presto, but, but the drum solo had the drumming from Scars in it. So you could say that Presto was represented in that tour via the drum solo and very interesting how neil talks about the mood of that drumming it's kind of like tribal jungle like you know there's a call and response type of drumming again super creative stuff that you don't hear any other drummer do you hear it from him and the incredible independence and control that he has he has all his four limbs flailing around and it's a steady beat absolutely incredible the drumming from the song Scars on Presto, yet another example of Neil's outstanding creativity. Next example I want to give of Neil's creativity is on yet the next record, Roll the Bones, and the song is Bravado. This is very interesting. So previously, his drum kit had two bass drums, but from Roll the Bones forward, his drum kit had a single bass drum with a double pedal. 
So what that allowed him to do, since now he had one less big drum, he kind of like analyzed his drum kit and he figured, oh, I can put another floor tom to my left in addition to the one I already have, the ones I have on my right. So what that allowed him to do was come up with completely new drum parts that incorporated both the floor tom to his right and now the floor tom to his left, which was not there before the Roll the Bones studio record. That allowed him to, to come up with the creative drumming that he did on Bravado. It's a masterpiece of independence drumming, showing uh, how you know each limb is doing something really you know responsible for doing something completely different but it being in time and incorporating the two side floor toms that he didn't have before to just create something absolutely beautiful and masterful so bravado is an example of him creating something new because now he had new toys to play with so that's my seventh example yes we'd like to carry on the song, uh, it's also from Counterparts. This song is, uh, I guess, could only be described as demented. This is uh, called Double Agent. I really like Double Agent. Very unique. Giddy liked to call this song demented. They only played it during the Counterparts tour. This is an interesting song drum-wise as well. For one thing, Neil does not use the hi-hat at all in that song just doesn't use it. What he's doing instead, he's just writing the China symbol and the ride symbol alternatively during the verses. And the way he's dancing around the the beat with the snare and the bass drum throughout the whole song, it's just, it's different. It's like, it's not like a straight four beat disco beat type of thing. It's just very like, you know, jolting, right? And interestingly enough, as he's not using his hi-hat at all, and he's using the China and ride symbol to keep the beat. During most of the song, he's using the China, hitting the China symbol on the downbeat and the ride symbol on the upbeat. And then during the outro verse, he switches it. He's now using the ride symbol as the downbeat and the China symbol on the upbeat. So he reverses it. So any drummer who tries to imitate that, they have to like, almost learn the song completely again <laughs> because he changes it up at the end. Again, it's another masterful display of him coming up with a drum part and varying it, varying the same motif within the same song, just flipping it over. And if you listen to the verse in the beginning of the song and listen to the last verse, you'll, no you'll notice the difference in Neil Peart's playing. So double agents off of counterparts, another great example of Neil's creativity. The ninth example I want to give of Neil Peart's creativity is Test for Echo, the whole record. I think Test for Echo is a much maligned record. There seems to be a lot of people who don't like it, but let's set aside the record as a whole and just take a look at the drumming on this record. It is outstanding. He switches to traditional grip because of the transformation of his style of drumming, which uh, to me was a new era for him, for him from that point forward. Uh, the Neil Peart that we knew from Counterparts and back, that's gone. Now we have this more refined, more jazzy-like drummer who's playing rock, whereas before you had a rock drummer who maybe threw in a little jazz here and there, but hardly ever. Now he's sounding more jazzy, but you know he still had the power of, it was Neil, he's still Neil, Neil Peart. But this test felt Eric test for echo record whether it was because he switched to the traditional grip i don't think so I, I think it was part of it but it just made him play more groovy he was a more groovy drummer what they call in the pocket is definitely in the pocket in this record it, he was just a, he was a different drummer and just the fact that he did that and we have the example from his a work in progress vhs slash dvd where he explains every single song how he played it why he chose to play it certain drum parts the way he did it is a master class of creativity and, and getting into the mind of neil as far as when he's coming up with a drum part why he plays that ride symbol there why he chose to hit the china this certain china symbol once on the whole record that was a creative decision why did he do that well stuff like that and the fact that he switched over to traditional grip for the whole record he didn't do that again he played your traditional grip more in subsequent w records, but never a whole record. 
It was just this one, Test for Echo. Absolutely creative. The whole thing. So if you want to see more of how creative Neil was for Test for Echo, you can listen to just the songs and just notice how groovy the drumming is. Or you can watch the Work in Progress DVD and watch him explain how he selected all of his drum parts. And again, a masterclass in creativity. And the last example I want to give uh, regarding Neil Peart's creativity, him being one of the best, if not the best, creative drummer of all time, is Headlong Flight from Clockwork Angels. That whole record is, is a lot of, there's a lot of creative drumming going on there. I'm picking this one because this record kind of came back to a really heavy rock type sound. Neil, now in his 60s, more or less, around there, in 2012, man, he was hitting those drums hard. <laughs> and Headlong Flight, when you hear the studio version, definitely sounds harder and rockier than in the live versions. There's a lot of different changes and different drum parts throughout the song, especially during the verses, the verses and bridges. Every time those different motifs came back musically, he's doing a different pattern every single time. And I actually made a video of my difficulties trying to cover that song. And <laughs> it took me so long to learn how to play that song because he was doing something different practically. Uh, every four bars, he was doing something different. And if it, the music was the same, another part of the song, he's drumming differently. Even the way he was hitting the toms, the way he was hitting the china, he was, the way he was riding, he, it was, you know, he's just all over the place. And then the, there's the drum solo in the middle where it sounds like he's hitting a lot of drums, but it's he's hitting mostly uh, a tom and a snare, just alternating between the two. And that's something that I've always found hard to do. So I threw in some other stuff in my interpretation of that part. But again, at his age, I, I don't know of a drummer that is creative and really hard hitting at the same time, the way he was, particularly in this song, and particularly, particularly in that whole record. Just amazing. What a way to go out if that was their intent. If Clockwork Angels was to be their last record, okay, good. I mean, what could, could they have done better than that one? Maybe at their age, probably not. I think they knew that the end was near in that regard. Maybe. So there you have it. Those are my 10 examples of Neil Peart's greatness as far as composition and creativity go. And you, all of these examples, he doesn't repeat any of them in any, any other songs. We can go through several more examples, several more videos, 10 at a time, of all of these creative decisions that Neil made that just made the songs so much fuller. You guys remember, three members, they each had a lot to do to make, to create a grand sound. And I, th I think as far as a three piece goes, each one of them filled the space quite well. Neil was an absolute genius, legend at creating drum parts that not only fit the song, but were very musical. That was another thing I was going to say. One of the most musical drummers ever. Very musical. It's almost like he was more a musical drummer than a rhythmic drummer, which almost every drummer is a rhythmic drummer because drums are rhythm. But there are some drummers that are very musical, but He's definitely in that group. He's one of the most musical drummers that there ever have been. And and going on the similar vein of Neil not being able to play the same thing twice when that the next the song comes back to the same uh, kind of pattern. Um, and we, Jim, I think we were talking about this. So at the end of the first city, you know, where he says, "I feel the wrench of hard realities," then he does the. Mm -hmm. uh, the single stroke roll is what it is, but he does it on the snare. Then he goes over to the top, right? Mm -hmm. and, and and the second time when Getty sings, I feel the wrench of hard realities, Neil's doing this really crazy fill, right? But it's still single stroke rolls. Mm -hmm. He's just doing left, right the whole time. Oh, yeah. So oh, yeah. It, it's just amazing that he's, he's doing the same. He's doing the same thing, but he's creating it in a different way that it sounds completely different. And completely musical in a different way too and that was his genius where he could take something that's simple and it's it sounds com very complicated but to create those patterns that he did with just one rudiment and it sounds completely different you know it it just elevates the song and it makes 
the song's not boring because when this when those motifs come back they're played differently and it makes for for more creative listening so you know that's one of my favorite parts of the song actually that mm -hmm. uh, that fill at the end too just the a repeat. great way to finish off the song yep. yeah what you saw in the opening was my appearance on a rush roundtable on the rush fans youtube channel and this time we were talking about the camera eye and how great that song is all different aspects of the song and one of the things I focused on was Neil Peart's drumming. Of course, who wouldn't focus on Neil Peart's drumming on pretty much any Rush song? And focused on, as you saw there in the opening, the single stroke roll. For those of you who don't know, and I'll just expound on it just a little bit, drummers have what's called a vocabulary of drumming. It's called the rudiments. There's like 40 of them. And there are different uh, drum patterns that are named differently depending on what the pattern is. So in that opening, I was talking about the single stroke roll which is le just tr drumming left, right, left, right. And after that, it got me thinking about how great a drummer Neil Peart was and why he was considered one of the best drummers of all time. Many consider him to be the best drummer of all time. I have a difficult with calling anybody the best at anything because there's so many variations. There's so many things that certain people would consider important and other things completely uh, that other people would consider important. So it's really hard to determine who the best of anything is. Um, Neil certainly is my favorite drummer. So I decided to think, what was Neil particularly good at? <laughs> he was particularly good at a lot of things. But as far as the rudiments go, I started kind of thinking about how he drums and what he tended to specialize in as far as those rudiments go. And I came to the conclusion that I think he was the best at performing the single stroke roll. To play the drums on a technical level, there are a lot of very good technical drummers that were faster than Neil, that knew more about drumming in general than Neil did, and that were just better than him in a lot of different ways. But to me, in one way that Neil trumped all of them was his creativity and the way he played drums to fit the narrative of the song. And having the advantage of being the lyricist, um, he knew what Getty was going to sing, so he could tailor his drumming creativity to not only, the mu not only the music, but the singer. So that was an advantage that he had. But the single stroke roll, he was a master at that. And it's difficult to play something that is so rudimentary, <laughs> drum rudiments, as, the, as a left, right, left, right jump, drum pattern and make it sound so musical and so different in uh, pretty much every song that he played where he implemented that rudiment. So without me talking too much, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, do an, a little expose of many instances, instances of Neil playing the single stroke role and how creative he made it sound. And you probably didn't notice that he was actually just playing a simple left, right, left, right pattern, but it sounded so musical and so Neil that to me, I consider him the best single stroke roll drummer of all time. So enjoy Neil showing us how he was the master of the single stroke roll.
Neil Peart versus John Bonham. I mean, should we even go there? Hell yes! We're going to talk about comparing Neil Peart to John Bonham, or Neil Peart versus John Bonham, or if it's even worth having that discussion, and if it's even worth settling that score, if that's something that, that some people feel that it's important to do. Okay, so what do I mean by comparing Neil Peart to John Bonham? Well, for starters, people like comparisons. People like pitting this person versus that person. People like lists and people like to know what other people think about their favorite whatever, favorite drummer, favorite guitarist, singer, and on and on. But, you know, sometimes people take it a little seriously and take it like way over the, the deep end, they even get angry for even making the comparisons at all. Some people think that, you know, it's just about enjoying the music and, you know, it doesn't matter who's better if there is a better. And for the most part, I concur with that. It really, the bottom line is about enjoying the music. It's not so much about comparing this person to that person. And I wouldn't say I'm new to the game as far as comparing Neil Peart to John Bonham or figuring out who's better. Um, that's been done a bunch of times already. So why am I doing it now? Well, I've thought about it a long time and I've also wondered if there was an objective way to determine if one drummer is better than the other. Not to put one down and one above, but just to see if there are things we could look at by what they did, by what they accomplished, what they published, if we can compare some of that and determine if this drummer was better at doing certain things than the other was, or if there's an unfair advantage that one has over the other as far as exposure goes. What am I, what am I, uh, what do I mean by that? For starters, if you compare how many albums Led Zeppelin has sold versus how many Rush has sold, it's like, you know, Rush is like a street performer compared to uh, Led Zeppelin. I think Led Zeppelin sold over 200 million records, like way more than that. And Rush has sold a mere 40 million, which is nothing to sneeze at. And they have their, you know, their records as, as well as far as uh, selling albums, albums and that kind of thing. But Really, no one can come close, uh, as far as rock bands go, uh, to Led Zeppelin. I think, you know, ACDC, they've sold over 100 million records. Uh, I probably should have looked up these numbers, but I'm pretty close. <laughs> I think those numbers are pretty close. But, you know, Led Zeppelin, I mean, admittedly, they are the number one rock band of all time, at least as far as exposure goes. Were they the best at everything? No, but they really good <laughs> at pretty much everything. They came at a time where their sound, when Led Zeppelin 1 came out, it was just so different and so bombastic in your face that that was not heard before. And it was, it was really a great time uh, to play or to come up with that kind of music because it, it really had an impact on rock forever. And Rush was a beneficiary of that. You know, the early Rush modeled themselves after uh, Led Zeppelin, especially their first album was very Led Zeppelin-esque. And I would think uh, John Rutsey, um, the original drummer of Rush, maybe you wanted to be like John Bonham because I think he sounded somewhat like him in a sense. But as far as if you base it on album sales, hands down, more people know who John Bonham is than who know Neil Peart, at least on a general level. If we're talking about the drum community, pretty much everyone knows who both of them are. So as far as making this as objective as possible, there's one thing we need to eliminate from the equation. John Bonham unfortunately died at the age of 32 on September 25th, 1980. And Led Zeppelin had only made eight studio albums at the time. I think they did another one after that. That was like a compilation. I forget the, what it's called. But really there are officially eight studio albums with John Bonham until he died. So he was 32 and change. So there's, it would be unfair to compare Neil Peart's entire album repertoire to John Bonham's. If we want, if we do that, then Neil Peart is hands down the better drummer because he's, he did way more things. He got a chance to do way more things because he was alive longer. So it's kind of like not fair to do that. So to make it kind of fair, I looked to see how old these guys were at a certain time. I took some notes too. I have them right here. How old was John Bonham when he recorded his last album with Led Zeppelin? He was 31 years, two and a half months old. That's when they released In Through the Outdoor in August of 79. When Neil Peart was 31 and two and a half, 31 years, two and a half months old, it was late autumn 1983 
and their last record that they released was Signals, which was in September of 1982. And actually, it was on September 9th, which was three days shy of Neil's 30th birthday. So the next album that Rush produced was Grace Under Pressure, which came out in April of 1984, when Neil was 31 years and seven months old. So to make a fair comparison, we really can only compare the albums that John Bonham made, that life's, that span of time versus Neil Peart's age at the same time that John Bonham made his last record. So we can only really compare Fly By Night to Signals to uh, John Bonham's Led Zeppelin 1 to In Through the Outdoor. I think that would be a fair comparison. So let's forget everything that, ha oh, we can include the tours of each two. Uh, the tour, if we wanted to check out anything live, we could in include the tour of In Through the Outdoor and the Signals tour. But as far as Neil Peart goes, anything after that, Grace Under Pressure Forward does not exist because it's not fair because John Bonham wasn't here, so we can't make that comparison. So what about that span of time when they were about similar age, let's say, between John Bonham's eight albums with Led Zeppelin and Neil Peart's eight albums? We're not counting Rush's first album because he wasn't the drummer, but his eight albums from Fly By Night to Signals. What can we say about that? Well, to prepare myself for this comparison, I did a lot of Led Zeppelin listening and it's something I have never done before I actually listened to all eight records straight through which is not a bad thing because Led Zeppelin I mean they're, they're pretty awesome I mean there's a lot of great music there so pretty much from Led Zeppelin all the way through uh, in through the outdoor and I also watched the live concert footage of the song remains the same which was the houses of the holy tour in 1973 and I also watched some live footage uh, a few songs, I couldn't really find a, a complete show, but uh, some live footage from the In Through the Outdoor tour, um, Achilles Last Stand, which is one of the songs that they played on that tour, which I think was on their Presence record. That's a great song, by the way. And I noticed, I looked at uh, John Bonham live playing from The Song Remains the Same and that live performance of Achilles Last Stand from the In Through the Outdoor tour. And he was a different drummer. He was like, I mean, he was noticeably better. You know, when he was younger, he played a little more bombastically but in the live footage from later years he you can see that he's more controlled I mean he knows his stuff I mean muscle memory kicks in you pretty much know your songs you know what to play when you how you're playing them and how to conserve your energy in a long show and that kind of thing so I mean he's playing really well but I did notice that throughout the whole span of Led Zeppelin's records right from Led Zeppelin one all the way to the last one to me John Bonham's playing was pretty much the same throughout there wasn't really much improvement or a lot of different things based on what I heard from the first album and going through successively. There were different types of styles being played. There were some slow songs and obviously there were the fast songs. They're the bombastic songs. Uh, you know, they're the, the classic tunes that everybody knows. I don't need to list them out here. But to me, his playing was pretty much the same throughout. And I think many would agree to that. It was definitely the foundation of that sound. There's no question that you hear a Led Zeppelin song and unless there's no drums in it, John Bonham is a force. He's a presence in the band. But I think that's part of why he's so popular and why he's considered such a great drummer. Deservedly so, because he was in Led Zeppelin. I mean, everybody is an elite artist in that band. So he's playing to their level and he's playing to the type of music that they play, which, which is pretty straight ahead rock and roll. There were elements of progressive rock that seeped in uh, from time to time and later, later times. And Achilles Last Stand is probably an, an example of that. But for the most part, his drumming style didn't change. It was pretty much the same. Now, if you listen to Neil Peart from Fly By Night through Signals, there's a whole bunch of different styles. <laughs> Not so much styles, but they were a progressive metal band. So they're playing all these different time signatures and they're writing stories like, you know, 2112 and Hemispheres. And there's all different types of drumming involved to create a visual experience from the audi auditory experience. And each of the three guys in that band were also elite artists themselves in creating that space and creating that atmosphere. And Neil was not just a drummer, he's also a percussionist. So as the years went by, his kit grew and 
I've seen drummers that have big kits and a lot of them are just for show. Neil absolutely, every single piece of his kit he used and it always served the song. It was never overly played, but tastefully played. There was a lot of intricate playing. There was a lot of different compositions of drum patterns to satisfy the type of music they were playing. And each album that went along and along, it just got better and better. And I think if someone were to listen to Led Zeppelin's catalog up to In Through the Outdoor, and they just listened to the drumming or paid more attention to the drums, and if they did the same thing with Fly By Night all the way to Signals for Neil Peart, and you know, whether you like the bands or not, if we're talking about comparing the drummers, we just, we're trying to see which drummer was the better drummer. I would say all around, Neil Peart was the better drummer because you can tell his progression over the years. He just got better and better and better. Whereas uh, John Bonham's style pretty much stayed the same from beginning to, to the end. It's so another thing too that I thought of, could Neil Peart play in Led Zeppelin? And I think he could play in Led Zeppelin. I think he would actually introduce more complexity that would still fit into what the band was doing. But I don't think the same would be in reverse. I think John Bonham would be an exaggerated version of John Rutsey, actually. Not that they were the same uh, as far as ability, because I think obviously John Bonham was a substantially better drummer than John Rutsey, but John Bonham was a rock drummer. I wouldn't consider him necessarily a progressive rock drummer. And they definitely rushed the band, definitely would not have progressed in the style that they ended up doing with Neil if they had a drummer like John Bonham in the band. And I think of songs that I think Bonham would find difficult to play or would not have come up with. I think of songs like La Vira Strangiato. Um, and I think of songs like Free Will, where the instrumental breakdowns in parts of those songs, I, I don't think that John Bonham could have pulled that off the way Neil Peart did. I just think Neil Peart is more of a compositional drummer, more creative drummer in that sense. But I think John Bonham fit perfectly for what Led Zeppelin did. So it depends really ultimately what you feel is important. If you feel like a really steady groove and bombastic drumming is what makes the ideal rock drummer and I think that does make the ideal drummer, then John Bonham wins that because Neil was not that type of drummer. He's not a bombastic, he wasn't a bombastic drummer with like big, huge sounds. His sound always fit into the three. None of the members of the band overshadowed any of the other ones. They were all very cohesive in their sound and intricate in their sound, which is why I think by the time Neil's ability in signals compared to John Bonham's drumming ability in In Through the Outdoor, I think if you look at the technical drumming aspect, I think that Neil Peart surpasses John in that sense. So in my estimation, Neil Peart is the better drummer of the two. Now, that's my opinion based on technical ability, and it's my opinion based on Neil's knack for composition, and the fact that he had an advantage that he was the lyricist for the band, so he could he gave the lyrics to the other two guys. They finagled the music and rearranged a couple of the lyrics maybe. But in the, in the end, Neil knew the lyrics so he could create his drum parts based on what he knew already. And he could play to the singer, which was a huge advantage as well. One thing I'd like to do, I'm gonna include a link below to a video um, that's on the, on the YouTubes of Rush during their Signals tour. And the video quality is not that good and the sound quality is not that good, but, but it is good enough. It's um, Rush playing Free Will during the Signals tour. And they're playing really fast at a tempo. I don't think they've ever played it that fast. They didn't play it that fast before. And I don't think they played it that fast after that tour either. But Rush fans know the instrumental breakdown in the middle of that song, how technically difficult that is. And they're playing it super fast. And you can hear every single hit that Neil Peart does in that instrumental breakdown in the whole song. But that, that part in the middle, when I heard that and I, I thought of other drummers that could possibly pull that off and it, I, I mean, I can't think of any <laughs> really. Um, and I don't think John Bonham could play like that either. So, you know, I'm trying to see if there's concrete evidence, not so much going on feeling, because if you go by feeling, 
everybody's right because it's your feeling, it's your opinion. Everybody has an opinion and they're all valid and everybody's feelings are valid too. But I've been trying to find concretely if I could compare these two drummers and see which one would stand out more. And I think from a technical perspective and I think from a compositional perspective, which those things are important to me, I think Neil Peart wins that. Now, in saying all of that, does that mean that you know I have to like Neil Peart better because I think he's a better drummer? No. Does that mean that I I can demean another drummer and say, well, they're not that good, and even or they're not as good, or I can like argue to the point of getting angry because someone is not agreeing with my opinion? No, it's not about that at all. I think that we can have these this, this, these discussions, these comparisons, and I and I think that that's expected because that just makes us dig deeper and see not only that we feel that someone is better, but when someone challenges us as to, well, I think this person's better, then you start talking about little details, then you start digging in, and you actually end up appreciating the music more. You end up appreciating the artist more, and you just end up enjoying all of it. And that's really the bottom line. It's not to poke fun at someone else, it's not to demean someone else's ability, it's really to appreci appreciate everybody's ability. Lastly, I think I wanna say, there comes a level of excellence in musicianship that they're all best. They're, they're, all, they're all the best. So you have drummers like Neil Peart, like John Bonham, like Phil Collins, I'll put up there, well, main, in the 70s mainly, uh, Carl, Carl Palmer. I'm thinking drummers that are from that era, mostly. Alan White of Yes. But in the end, in the end, I think I've heard that song before. Neil Peart versus John Bonham. I mean, my preference, because this is not all about Rush YouTube channel. Uh, I may pick Neil Peart in that case, but for the reasons I've expressed here, it's not so much my feeling, although it is my feeling, but I just wanted to put out there the actual reasons why I think that Neil Peart ended up being a better drummer than John Bonham was, just comparing their contemporary music that they published during the times they were of the same age. Because I think any, th any other type of comparison would be unfair. If you think this drum solo, which is Neil Peart's most reacted to solo, is his best. You'd be wrong. Many years ago on my blog, theparadiddler.com, I ranked Neil Peart's drum solos from least to best. At the time, there were eight officially published drum solos of Neil Peart and of Rush. Many years have gone by. Rush is done. 2015 was their last concert year. And there are a few more of officially published drum solos. Actually, now there are 11. Actually, there are a few more than 11, but we'll get to that later in the video. But in any case, you know, I went back to revisit the subject and it made me rethink the order of what I thought are Neil Peart's uh, best drum solos, not his best drum solos, of his officially released drum solos, what's the worst one all the way up to his best one? If you go through YouTube and you see which drum solo YouTubers react to the most, the one that's generally picked is the one from the R30 tour, the one in Frankfurt, Germany. And that's a really great solo, there's no question about that. But I think many fans are missing out on some solos that are even better than that one. Actually, there are several that Neil Peart published, or Rush published, that are actually better than that one. And what we're going to endeavor today is to rank those solos from worst to best. And that way you can react to all of them if you want, or you can just see the incredible musician that Neil Peart was and how the progression of his solos was presented throughout the years. And we can see if the solos that he did later were necessarily better than the ones before just because he grew as a musician, he was more knowledgeable, but that necessarily mean that those later were actually better. Or are there other criteria that would determine which solo was better than another? So what are the solos that we're gonna consider? Well, there's 11 of them and I'm gonna list them right over here, or actually I'll just list them on the screen. In chronological order, they are All the World's a Stage from the 2112 tour, Exit Stage Left, YYZ from the Moving Pictures tour, A Show of Hands, YYZ from the Hold Your Fire tour, Counterparts, Anatomy of a Drum Solo on DVD, The Rhythm Method, that would be the Test for Echo solo, you can hear that on different stages, 
old baterista, the Rush in Rio solo that he did there in for the Vapor Trails tour. Der Trommler, which is the aforementioned uh, R30 tour drum solo. This Lag Worker, which is the drum solo he did during the Snakes and Arrows tour. Moto Perpetuo, which is the drum solo he did in the Time Machine tour. In the Clockwork Angels tour, he did kind of a threesome. Well, where's my thing? Here it is. And then Drum Bastica is like an extended drum solo in Headlong Flight. And then the Percussor, which is the last part of, we could call it a three-piece solo in the Clockwork Angels tour. And then the last one, he called it, Neil Peart did, The Story So Far. That was the solo in the R40 tour, which is in the middle of Cygnus X1. So those are the solos as they appear chronologically. So those are the ones we're going to rank. So which one of those were was his not so great solo all the way to which was his best solo of all of those? Now there's certain criteria that I'm going to exclude from listing in you know from consideration in these in this in this list. One of the types of solos that Neil did that I'm going to exclude is anything he did outside of Rush. I'm only going to rate the solos that he did that he performed inside of a rush context for example anything he did with burning for buddy i'm not going to include any of those solos or you know he did he had a great solo in the dave letterman show uh, i'm not going to rate that one although that one is kind of like a condensed version of the time machine to, uh, solo that he did so they're same ish but obviously the one in time machine was extended also the solos that appeared during the anniversary releases, for example, 2112, A Farewell to Kings, Hemispheres, and Permanent Waves. Well, even moving pictures now, that's the latest one. I'm not going to include anything from those, any solos from those releases. Up until Hemispheres, the solos that he did there were very similar to the ones from, that he did in 1976 during the 2112 tour. So it's kind of, they're similar-ish, so I won't be going into those. And we'll talk about the latest moving pictures release, the drum solo that Neil Peart did there on the Live in YYZ show, and compare that a little bit to the Exit Stage Left one when we get there. Now, there's an interesting phase that Neil Souls went through over the years, and I noticed that you could categorize his solos into like three eras. For example, the solos that he performed from Fly by Night, which we don't necessarily have an official release of any solo he did from the Fly By Night tour, which was his first, you know, the second record of Rush, but the first time he appeared with them. From that time to Signals, I call that the acoustic era, where there were no electronics, it was just uh, Neil on his kit with his acoustic drums and all of his uh, percussion instruments, the chimes, the bells, uh, the triangles, and all of that stuff. So I call that the acoustic era. And then the next era, we would have the electronic era, which was from Grace Under Pressure all the way to R30 where he started, during the Race Under Pressure, incorporating electronics, electronic drums, triggers, stuff like that, to trigger all of these sounds that he had with his percussive instruments. Now he could actually program, program them into the electronic kit. And then over the years, he started adding triggers that would trigger off uh, big band sounds and music he could drum to. So that era was from Grace Under Pressure all the way to R30. And then what, I'm, what I call the orchestral era, which was Snakes and Arrows to the end, to R40, where he had whole compositions, uh, both on the acoustic kit and the electronic kit. And he, could, he actually, on occasion, switched back and forth multiple times between the two so that he can perform these compositions. So that those last few years, say from 2007 to 2015, that would call that the orchestral era of Neil Peart's solos. Okay, without further ado, let's rank these solos. Neil Peart's drum solos... From worst to best, starting at number 11. Number 11 is the rhythm method from the Test for Echo Tour, different, uh, as heard on different stages. I think that was an off night for Neil. If you listen to that solo, he's not exactly crisp and clean in his, in his roles. And he's a little slower uh, when, he does the, when he plays on the electronics. He's not as crisp and clean as... Some of the solos we're going to talk about later in the video. I think that for that solo, I don't think he was involved with picking which solo would appear on the different stages releases when it was released to the public. I think probably on some other night, there probably was a better solo than the one that they chose for different stages. I'm not going to go into too much all of the reasons why that's the last one. 
But if you hear this solo and then listen to the other ones in this list, you'll see that all of the other ones were performed better than the one that he performed on the different stages release that was selected to appear on that release. And I think that if he was involved in selecting the solo, I don't think he would have picked this one. I think he would have picked another one. So that's my number 11 pick. Number 10 is All the World's a Stage drum solo from the 2112 tour, as we hear it at the end of Working Man on that release. Now, it's not that there's really anything bad with this solo. It's a very good solo. The issue is that it's an old one. <laughs> it's a, one of his earlier ones, and you can hear the youth of this solo. But what's interesting about this solo is that there's a lot of there's a few things in there that are the precursor to pretty much all of the solos that come after it. So you have, for example, the double-handed crossover that he does between the snare and the tom, uh, the snare and the floor tom. He does it in that solo. He also plays with the um, the very popular uh, cowbell pattern that he that he did that he does on pretty almost all of his solos. That's the first time we hear it there, way back in 1976. And there are a few other things here and there that you hear this solo, then you hear some of the other solos later. You figure, oh, uh, I, now I know where that came from. If you hear this solo, you'll hear bits and pieces of it ahead in the future. So there are a lot of things, I think maybe stubbornly, <laughs> that Neil held on to that he liked, He just liked to do them. He just liked to play them year after year after year. And he would do is he would just embellish his solos to in some way or other, include these, what I call, um, pinnacle elements of his soloing, things that he created from the beginning and just kept them pretty much all the way to the end of his career. Number nine in ranking Neil Peart's released official drum solos is the Drumbastica and the Story So Far, his solo that he played in the R40 tour, the last tour, pretty much in the middle of Cygnus X1. I mentioned Drumbastica because on the nights that they played Headlong Flight, which I think they played that song every night on that tour, R40. But he did have that extended solo in the middle that's longer than the solo that's in the studio release of Headlong Flight. But anyway, he had that. And he also had the solo in the middle of Cygnus X1. And I think you could hear a little bit Neil's age in this solo. It was his last solo. He was in his in mid early 60s. Yeah, they were they were all in their early 60s at this point. Uh, a little close edge, close to 65. So, you know, these guys are really playing. The fact that they could do that tour at all, to me, is an accomplishment in and of itself, the three of them. But that Neil could play, even at that age, so hard. And he was very meticulous. You know, there was really nothing wrong with any of his hits or any of his patterns. Um, there really wasn't anything new, per se. I think if you went from night to night in that tour, you'd notice some differences that he would incorporate. But... At this point, he's not really creating anything new. I think pretty much everything that he played were things that he played before. And he would use his um, mini marimba, the electronic xylophone there, to trigger an ambience for, for the solo. It wasn't so much that he's using all of these different percussive sounds that he triggers from there. But, yeah, it was basically uh, this is the end solo, his last solo. And the other solos that will appear later in this countdown, you know, have a lot more in them. But I think it's because, you know, I don't think there was anything else he could do, but he could still play. So not one of his best solos, but it was still definitely a great solo. Number eight in the countdown to Neil Peart's best published drum solo is a show of hands drum solo on YYZ during the Hold Your Fire tour. This was a very interesting solo. I mean, it shows still his youth, and not only that, but it was a really different solo from the solo he recorded previously, uh, chronologically, in 1981 for YYZ and Exit, to the Exit Stage Left. This was in the Hold Your Fire Tour, 88, 87, 88. It was significantly, significantly different because the solo in 81 was during the acoustic era. Now this is in the electronics era, and he's really incorporating the electronic drums and there are two versions of this solo. There's one in the video of A Show of Hands, and there's another one in the, what was then the LP cassette, you know, DVD, uh, CD, whatever. But there are two different versions. The version on the CD or the record incorporates the electronic drums, whereas on the DVD, he's pretty much focused on the acoustic kit. 
But yeah, this is a very bombastic drum solo. This is where he includes like big band sounds, and it was really, really different uh, and um, uh, quite innovative for him anyway. But there were some other drummers that were using electronics and, and uh, the like, but the fact that Neil was very open to including all of these sounds, not only in the songs, but in the solo, it was very creative to hear, and it was becoming breaths of fresh air every tour because he had a lot of possibilities to expand his his repertoire, his abilities, both on the acoustic and the electronic skit. Great, great solo. Number seven on the countdown to Neil's top drum solo is Der Trommler, the drum solo he played during the R30 tour in Frankfurt. Now, this might be a shocker because this is the most reacted to drum solo on YouTube. I've seen a few reactions to a couple of the other drum solos. There are some solos where I've seen no reaction to them at all on YouTube, but this one is the most popular. So I'm saying that in Neil Peart's 11 officially published drum solos, this one is number seven. That there are six better drum solos than this one. Actually, I think that's quite astounding because uh, this is one of Neil Peart's longest drum solos. Um, this one, he really incorporates everything in his kit. You know, the electronic, acoustic, back to electronic, playing with the big band at the end, his staple patterns that he plays with his electronic drums. Um, it, incredible. So I understand why this would be such a solo, such a great uh, performance that a lot of people would, uh, want to react to. But I think that they're not aware that there are other solos that might even be more impressive than that solo. So I'm not going to talk too much about how great the, so the solo is because pretty much everybody's seen it. You can check it out. The Trommler from Germany, Frankfurt. That one is number seven. Number six in the countdown to Neil Peart's Neil Peart's top drum solo is the Slagworker. That's the drum solo from the Snakes and Arrows tour. That was the first of the orchestral solos where he had created a whole composition on the electronic kit. Not just different sounds, but pretty much like a song. Very beautiful. Now, I think he had learned, you know, pretty much he had progressed from the R30 tour. And, you know, he just added on that. And it became something that, that was pretty much fresh, not something that he had done before necessarily, and that he, you know, like I said, created a whole composition on the electronics kit. He was very precise, he was very, very fast, and in my previous ranking many, many years ago on my blog, I actually rated this one his best solo of all. But then, you know, after the years went by, I t looked at everything over after the, their career was over, and I thought, well, actually, maybe not. At the time... I read an article where he, a columnist, was writing an article for uh, for a magazine, asked Neil if he thought, well, what solo did he think was his best? And he said, this one, the, the current one, which at the time was the one he did in Snakes and Arrows. Because, as mentioned in previous videos, Rush always liked what they did last. So even though many, 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 many people may cite, for example, Moving Pictures as their best record, as their favorite record, if you would ask Rush, after releasing Snakes and Arrows as an example, what's their favorite record? They would say Snakes and Arrows because it would, it, would be, it would be their most recent and that would be their favorite. And in the case of the drum solos, that was his favorite. So that kind of influenced me, influenced my my uh, decision on that being the number one. I actually nicknamed that drum solo Arrival because I think he was very comfortable uh, where, where he arrived as far as his playing because he was very confident. Uh, of his fluidity, of his speed, everything. So, and, and it came out in that solo. It a, it's a very good solo. I think there are still even better solos than that one. But in any case, it was one that started what I call again the orchestral era of his solos. And there were better ones to come. Number five in the countdown to Neil Peart's best drum solo is the drum solo from the Clockwork Angels tour. Where's my thing? Here it is. Drumbastica and the percussor and this was very unique in that he spread out his solo throughout the concert there were three parts so the first solo was during where is my thing the instrumental that originally came out of roll the bones back in 91 which is a really good instrumental they only used it played it on that tour and they brought it back for the clockwork angels tour and very very good powerful powerful drum solo i mean I think he wanted to prove a point that he still was very strong, and uh, yeah, he was very strong. And so that was the solo in Where's My Thing. And then 
in another part of the show later when he played Headline Flight, that's where the middle drum solo was expanded and they called it Drumbastica. And then later in the concert, he did a solo just on the electronics called the, the Percussor. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful drum solo. Um, it, I mean, it wasn't really... I mean, you could call it a drum solo because it was just him, but it was actually... It was a composition. It was actually beautiful. It's beautiful. I would say that it's hard for me to describe how good it is. You just have to watch it. So that three-part drum solo, that's number five on my list towards Neil Peart's best solo. Number four in the quest to arrive at Neil Peart's best published drum solo is O Baterista. That is the drum solo performed during the Vapor Trails tour as we see in the Rush in Rio DVD. Now, this is a very interesting solo as well, in that it was the first of solos that, you know, during the Paper Trails tour, you know, they were, uh, Rush was on hiatus for five years, so um, the drum solo from Tess Ferreco was pretty much in the distance, and I think Neil had, when he came back, had a really fresh perspective on soloing, although there were a few things that he kept from the previous solo, but he made really good use of all of his toms, especially the floor tom on his left, uh, which that didn't exist prior to 1991, prior to Roll the Bones. That was the first time where, because he had one bass drum, he could actually fit another floor tom over here. So he'd do these patterns going back and forth that were really spectacular. And um, in this solo, Russian Rio, he made really good use of that. The, the sounds of his drums was really, really good. The crew had very little time to put everything together due to rain, but you know, I don't know how they pulled it off, but his drums sounded really good uh, for this solo. And another interesting thing about this solo is that it was pretty different from the solos previous to it and the solos after it. Those solos around this one were kind of similar, whereas this one, he took like kind of a tangent. It sounds very different from his, let's say, modern solos. Still in that electron... Um, electronics era I would call it but I would say it sounded pretty much unique in that time which again gives it a, a bump up in the ranking here and another thing this was a Grammy nominated solo this was one of the seven times that Rush was nominated for a Grammy they lost every time I go over that in a video series uh, but I'll put a link to the video where I talk about Neil Peart's O Baterista drum solo, which was nominated for a Grammy. I mentioned who they were up against and who they lost to and why I think they shouldn't have lost. But in any case, so go watch that video after you watch this one. But anyway, this was a fantastic solo and very much deserving to be in the number four spot. Number three in the journey to Neil Peart's number one published drum solo is Moto Perpetuo, which was the drum solo during the Time Machine tour. Oh man, the, you know, I think more... It's more, I want to whet your appetite to go watch these solos. This one, as far as in the orchestral era, was the best one. Better than R40, better than Clockwork Angels, better than Snakes and Arrows. This was the top solo from that era. I just encourage you to go watch it. I would say watch the Snakes and Arrows one, and then watch this one, and, and compare. It's it. Neil Peart is just on fire. Spectacular. Perfect timing with everything. He has lots of power, lots of precision. That night, that whole concert, they were on. And the band the band members at times would speak about a whole tour and they would mention that there were very few nights when they were when they felt that they were perfect or almost perfect. They're like spot on that at the end of the night they were like, Wow, that was really good. That didn't happen very often. But this night was one of those nights where everything was you know, everything was spot on. And this drum solo, Moto Perpetuo, was was outstanding. Everything was great, just spectacular. Um, yeah, I would just say go check it out. So this is the number three best drum solo by Neil. The number two, the runner-up, the silver medal, number two best drum solo published by Rush and Neil Peart is Exit Stage Left, YYZ, Moving Pictures Tour, 1981. This is the solo that I call the sentimental favorite because a lot of people like this solo as Neil Peart's favorite, uh, as their favorite Neil Peart drum solo. Because, you know, for one, a lot of fans became fans of Rush during the moving pictures era, and then Exit Stage Left comes out and it's like blows everybody away. 
And that drum solo that is there, it's a combination of the solos from the previous tours. I mentioned the All the Worlds a stage uh, back at number 10. And some of the, the solos that were after that were kind of similar to that one. But then in 81, I think Neil came to kind of like a, a plateau. Not a permanent, not a permanent plateau, but of skills where he was so precise, so fast, so creative, using all parts of his drum kit. And that solo said to everybody, hey, I'm here. I'm Neil Peart, and I'm an awesome rock drummer. <laughs> I mean, this is a, just, it's cited from, by many as one of, as Neil Peart's best drum solo. And, you know, I can understand why. It's one of the, I think it's the shortest drum solo in this list. It's only a little over three minutes. Not even I don't think it's even three and a half minutes. But it just packs so much in so little space. No space is wasted. And he's very creative, like I said, in all parts of the kit. Kind of like, I think that's when he really started composing um, his drum solos. I think he solidified himself as one of the best drummers in the world during that time because of this solo and how popular it made him as a drummer. I mean, he was popular as a drummer before, as a, you know, acknowledged great drummer. But when this came out, it exploded the whole band, really. But, you know, everybody's abilities were exponentially more exposed. And this was the perfect solo that Neil Peart could have used to expose himself as one of the world's best drummers. So that drum solo is number two. Okay, so we've gone over ten of Neil Peart's officially published drum solos. And there, I think, maybe were some surprises there. Maybe not everybody thought that the Frankfurt drum solo was going to be so low on the list. But which is the number one? What is Neil Peart's best published drum solo? Well, that one happens to be the one from the Counterparts tour as published in the DVD, Anatomy of a Drum Solo. This drum solo epitomizes everything Neil Peart is as a drum soloist. And I actually call this drum solo the end of an era. And the reason I call it that is because after 90, 93 and 94, Neil Peart was getting antsy about his skills. He thought he had plateaued as a drummer. So he decided to take lessons with Freddie Gruber, kind of like a jazz drummer. And he started using traditional grips. I'll, I'll explain. So I got the drumsticks right here. So up to this time, Neil Peart was mainly a matched grip drummer. And on occasion, he would, you know grab his sticks this way, which is a traditional grip, right? But he didn't do that very often. But after 93, after the Counterparts tour, he was very antsy, and he wanted to try something different. So after that, he, he was more jazzy in his drumming and less rock, although he retained all of his rock drumming skills, but I think he added more of his jazz, more jazz skills after he took lessons with Freddie Gruber, all of Test for Echo, which was the record right after Counterparts, he played it all in traditional grip. So he was a different drummer, basically, after Counterparts. And I think that Neil Peart from Counterparts, Counterparts back, a lot of people like that Neil Peart more than the Neil Peart from Test for Echo forward as far as his drumming goes. Um, I think in general, you know, everybody likes Neil Peart, even to the end, but that drum solo epitomizes everything that Neil Peart was and everything that Neil Peart was going to be afterwards. It had everything. He had his, the rotating drum kit. He had the acoustic kit, which that kit was absolutely beautiful kit. It's actually my favorite drum kit of all of his kits, I believe, would be the counterparts kit. And then he had the electronic kit in the back, and, you know, the kit would swing back, and, you know, would turn around so that he can do his electronics uh, playing, and then it would switch back to the acoustic you know, all of everything that we've known him to play, the, the double-handed crossover, single-stroke roll that he's famous for, for playing. And he was very fast, very powerful, had a real gritty attitude. You can see it in his face when he's playing. That's the Neil Peart that a lot of people like. I think that a lot of people missed from the test for Echo Forward. But this solo pretty much incorporates, it's the all-around drum solo. It has everything that he had, he had played before with all of the, the rock drummer that he was, uh, with everything that he played, with everything that he did afterwards, it's all, it's all encompassed in that solo. And it's not the longest solo. I think it's seven minutes plus or eight, eight minutes, something like that. But man, it is a sight to behold. And I think that if 
we're talking about his best published drum solo. I'm saying that the counterpart solo from the Anatomy of a DVD, an Anatomy of a Drum Solo DVD is his best one. So that's the winner. Counterpart's drum solo from Anatomy of a Drum Solo DVD. And there you have it. That's the list. And I'm going to put them right here on the screen so you can see how I rank them. I think you have a lot of fun look, watching these drum solos and see. You can watch them in chrono or hear them because I, there's a couple of them that are only audio. The Exit Stage Left drum solo, which was ranked number two, that's audio only. And All the World's a Stage, that one is audio only as well. And also the, the 40th anniversary publication of Moving Pictures, which has another night in the Moving Pictures tour. That has another version of that Exit Stage Left drum solo. But I still think the one in Exit Stage Left from that night is better. It's That one is better. On January 7, 2020, the music industry lost one of its most respected and beloved musicians, the drummer for Rush, Neil Peart. He was only 67 years old, and he lost his battle to brain cancer at the time. And obviously, the music industry was very saddened by that news. I found out it via a text from a friend of mine, and you know, he just said, did you hear the news about Neil Peart? And I'm like, you know, what is he talking about? And then I looked it up and it's all over the internet. So it was a pretty, pretty devastating day for me. He was a huge influence on the way I see music in general, not just drumming. He made me want to play the drums, and that's what I ended up doing. I've played in a few bands, you know, not professionally, but you know, having fun with uh, bandmates and whatnot. And my style of drumming <laughs> is, you know, hugely influenced by him. And there are many songs that I've played from different bands, and a lot of the techniques that Neil Peart used in his songs. I've put them in these songs, even though they're bands that have nothing to do with Rush, but it just fit in the song so well. It wasn't that the songs even sounded like Rush, but when you play them, you can tell that I was influenced by him. At the time that he died, there was a lot of noise on YouTube. Not bad noise, but a lot of people making videos and expressing their condolences and doing tributes, you know, reacting to his drum solos and whatnot. And me personally, I didn't feel comfortable doing that. I just thought, well, I'll let things be, and maybe sometime I'll, I'll make a video myself about Neil, the drummer and the person. And not that I knew him personally, I never met him, but I felt like many people feel that it's almost like you knew him almost at a personal level because of how prolific he was with his lyrics and how much he expressed himself. And I kind of felt that way a little bit. I think I kind of know a little bit of what Neil thought about things. Would I have liked to have met him? Absolutely. But... I can't pretend a stranger is a long-awaited friend. So this video is coming out a year from his passing. And I thought, you know, after reflecting on it a little bit, I thought I'd just talk about a few of the things that made him my favorite drummer. And I made a little list and I just wanted to quickly mention them. I don't want to spend too much time on it, but I just wanted to show what made him my not only favorite drummer, but my favorite artist. You know, going above even being a drummer, above be being a musician, but just the artist in general, what things made him my favorite artist. And obviously most of it is related to his drumming style, but some of it also has to do with the person himself. One of the things I admired about him is that no part of his kit was wasted, regardless of the era he was in. So when he joined the band, he had you know a pretty big kit. It was a, it was a double bass kit. Um, but in all of the songs, he tastefully used all of it. It wasn't for show. It wasn't like some bands that I've seen where the drummer has a huge kit, but you don't see that he's using it that much. Neil was very melodic. He was purposeful with his drumming. And as his kit grew, when he impl implemented percussion, you know, the cowbells and, and the chimes and wood blocks and all of these different instruments, as you can see from his kit during the 70s and the early 80s, he didn't waste anything. If the song required it, he put it in. And if there was a way to use percussion or any part of his kit to make the song better, then he would put that in tastefully. And the best example probably of this is the song Xanadu, especially the live version from 1981. His incredible use of his whole kit, it seemed like he used every part of his kit for that song. And nothing was overdone, but it was expertly played. 
Another thing I loved about Neil as a drummer, as an artist, is he was not just a drummer, he was a composer. And many times he talked about how he not only positioned his drums, but how he tuned his drums in a particular way so that they would be very melodic. There's no getting around that drumming is pretty much a rhythm exercise. It's not really about melody. It's about keeping the beat. It's about providing a measure, basically, that the band can play to. But it seems like Neil was, he was outside of that. He really played his drums in a melodic way. So the song needed that melody from the drums for it to sound like Rush. Obviously, you have the melody from the guitar and the bass and the keyboards, but it was so interesting that Neil would, it was able to compose his drum parts so that there was melody to them. And his drumming was very musical. In a world where a lot of emphasis is given to technicality, that was not his thing. His thing was more about composing, about composing drum parts that fit the song, and he did that expertly. And he actually, to me, he put to rest the issue of needing to be technical. It's definitely beneficial to be technical and it's very important to have chops, but ultimately when the end user or the listener is hearing the song, they're not caring about the technique. They're mostly caring about the song itself, the melodies, and how they remember the song. Unless you're a drummer and you're specifically looking for technique, but that's the minority of people. Most people, they hear music because of the melodies and his drumming was a huge part of that melody of Rush because he was a composer of drums and not just a player of drums. Another thing I admired about Neil and this was something that Getty Lee mentioned actually and that struck home, struck home with me was that he was a monster musician and it was interesting that Getty used that expression about Neil not just that he was a monster drummer he was a monster musician and he was a monster musician because, like I mentioned before, he didn't just play the drums just to play the drums, to put in uh, ch chops or show off uh, how many rudiments he knew, put them in the song, however. He was a musician, and everything was meticulous about how he made his drum parts because he wanted it to sound always musical. And he would slave over drum parts to make sure that they would sound musical and not just sound like he was keeping a beat. And it's actually pretty admirable the work that he put in to make sure that his part was just as musical as Alex's chords or Giddily's uh, keyboards. Another thing I liked about Neil is that he had his opinions but he didn't force them on you. Throughout his writing as the lyricist for Rush you would see a lot of his opinions but you'd never, he wasn't the kind of person who would force them on you like you know say that you had to think this way. It was just his opinion about it and he was happy to express them and he was happy that someone would even listen to them at all. Um, whether you disagreed with him or not, I don't think to him it mattered. What mattered was that he was able to express what he thought and that people appreciated how, they ex how he expressed it. Not only through his words, but through how his bandmates created the music around those lyrics and how at the end he was happy with how his opinion was expressed through the band. And never in a way that was talking down to you, but mostly talking with you. Another thing I like, the lyrics itself, the, the fact that he was a lyric, the lyricist of the band, and it's very interesting to see the progression of his writing style throughout the years. When he was very young, I think he was very idealistic, you know, with songs like uh, Something for Nothing and A Farewell to Kings and Anthem, Beneath, Between and Behind. Those songs, to me, they are very like idealistic. A young writer expressing, exercising his, his ability to write it was very impressive for someone so young to write the way he did and to introduce science fiction in in the lyrics based on the books he liked to read and then later on he got more philosophical during the 80s and 90s and then actually I think in the 90s it got more personal where he would write more from a personal point of view more like talking with a friend about what he thought about different things be it uh, political issues or personal issues, interrelation, even romantic issues like songs like Cold Fire. No one could write about romance like Neil Peart did on that song. But it's just interesting how his lyrical style evolved over the years. And he didn't stay stuck in one genre of, of writing lyrics, let's say. He evolved as he matured as a writer, as an artist. 
uh, so did so did the lyrics and it showed throughout the years and it was always very interesting I also like that he didn't hoard his lyrics it's very interesting where he was very reliant on Getty as his editor because Getty had to sing the songs get had to sing his lyrics and he was okay with uh, Getty editing the lyrics that he gave him uh, it could have been that he took out Getty took out whole lines or whole you know whole whole paragraphs or even most of the song most of the lyrics that he that he gave and he was happy to go back and rewrite or whatever he he didn't say no this is what I want to say and this is how it's got to be done he was very free accepting criticism of his lyrics and because he was considerate of the person who had to sing them that maybe the person wasn't always going to agree with what he wrote so eventually there was a consensus that would come up where Getty was comfortable singing the song and that's ultimately because Neil wasn't stuck up about his lyrics being sung exactly how, how it was written. He was very flexible with that and that actually contributed obviously to the songs coming out the way they did. Another thing I liked about Neil, the intent that he played every single note. You look at his face when he plays, I mean it looks like he, you know, when he composes his drum parts he knows why or he knew why he played every single note the way he did. It seemed like there was nothing random and he, he left his ran, the randomness for when he did solos. But for the songs, every note to me, when I watched him play and when I hear them, it seemed like everything was put there specifically for a reason. And that intent in playing for a young person growing up listening to Rush, to me that was very impressive. And it made an impression on me that uh, when you're playing the drums, you gotta have an, you know, unless you're playing for randomness, just for random sake, you need to have an intent. You need to know what you want to do so that you're not flopping around when you're playing. Um, you know that there's a beginning, middle, and end. There's, you know, there are verses and choruses and bridges and all that stuff, and you need to know where you are. Uh, you need to play with intent. And I never saw a more intent, more intense player uh, than he was. And the absolute energy that it took to play like he did. And he did it night after night, uh, tour after tour, and it was amazing to me to see how in the end, even in the R40 tour, when he was in his 60s, that he could still play with that energy, with that intensity. That's something that uh, I admired about him. Another thing I noticed about him that I thought was pretty peculiar is that he never played the same thing twice in a song. Um, if you look at songs like Distant Early Warning, Far Cry, there's a bunch of others where you know the chorus would come around and every time the chorus comes around, the transitions, um, you know, in between the lines that the singer is singing, the fill is different every time it's different. And the way, you know, to come up with all of those different variations of fills that you'd have to play over and over in a song and remember them all. And then when you're playing them live, you're also playing those fills differently every single time you come around to that same part of the song. I thought it was pretty crazy. Um, it's so easy to just play the same thing when the chorus comes back because the words are the same, the music is typically the same, but Neil could not do it. And from an interview that I saw with Geddy Lee, uh, he also mentioned that they had a hard time convincing Neil to play the same pattern again when that motif of the song reoccurred, unless there was a really good reason that it served the song. Otherwise, Neil would just come up with something different and actually made it more interesting to watch him play and to listen because it, it, it wouldn't be boring because you, you would know hearing the song for the first time you don't know what to expect and then when you hear it subsequent times you see the genius of how he would create these drum fills every time those uh, same parts of the song came along and it actually you know it moved the conversation along basically in the song because of the way he varied those fills throughout the song it just made things a lot more interesting and it informed the way I play as well. Even when I'm covering other songs from other bands, I do that too. <laughs> and um, the musicians I play with, they notice that the songs sound more, you know, they sound more interesting because the, the, the drumming is a little busier and it just fills in the space more because you're putting in variety in those fills. And that's something I learned from Neil. I think the last thing I'm gonna say about Neil as far as one of the reasons I, I admired him so much and that he's actually my favorite all-time drummer, musician, artist. I think the main thing is that he was a humble guy. He was very reserved instead of being extroverted. He was a very funny guy. 
He always wanted to be treated just like everybody else. He never wanted to be famous. He just wanted to be recognized as someone who plays the drums. And for someone who had that kind of stature in the music industry, having not asked for it, just based merely on his talent and his humility, that goes a long way as far as making an impression on anybody who wants to become a musician or just wants to play for fun. That is the best attitude to have when you're playing with other people. If you are humble, you are wanting to make the whole experience better. In the case of Rush, he wanted to make the song better and he would do whatever it took to make the song better. And to do that, it requires humility because it requires that you have to hold back when the song doesn't require more from you. And also it requires you to step up when the song requires more of you. And your, your humility allows you to do all that. And throughout all of the years of Rush creating music, I think his humility was one of the things that most made him the drummer, the musician, the artist that he was. And that's something that's sorely missed in a lot of music today. No, but we have the music, we have 20 studio albums, we have all of the live albums, we have all the live videos. I'm hoping to see more music to be unearthed somewhere in the ar deep archives of Rush, videos of tours past that maybe we haven't seen. And we'll continue to, s to see why Neil Peart is considered one of the greatest, if not the greatest, rock drummer of all time. He certainly is in my book. Yeah, I miss the guy. I never met him, but to me, from a musical perspective, he was my mentor. He was my teacher. And I miss him.